Thank you, Lord. Amen, sis. Amen. Yeah, that's good. Amen. That's good. Amen. 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 Lord's good, ain't he? You can't brag on him too much. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. We are blessed. What a God we serve. First Corinthians chapter 16. Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church here in the end of this first epistle to the church. Down towards the end of this epistle, the things begin to pick up a little bit in their life, as we saw before, and you come into 2 Corinthians, you're dealing with the ministry instead of all the carnality and how your life can grow and become a blessing for the Lord, even though at one time maybe it was carnal. So there's a great picture here in the end of this book. But I want to show you something that the Lord's kind of put on my heart. I'm really interested in verse number 9 today. Uh, but we're going to read verses 1 through verse 9 and get to that, that verse. Paul describing what was going on in his life at that time. And you can take the th things that he says here in these first nine verses, especially towards the end of it right there in these first nine, and go to the book of Acts and you can see the, the missionary of the apostle Paul traveling and one of these it was actually, I believe, the third missionary journey of the Apostle Paul to the place of Ephesus where he spent, he said, three years when he called those elders together and discussed what things he had done there. And so he's talking about that work over there in, in Ephesus in that time in his life. So verse number one says in 1 Corinthians 16, what's the first word there? Wow. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so... Do ye, upon the first day of the week, which is Sunday, like we're gathered here today, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So Paul's exhorting the Corinthian church to give like they should upon the first day of the week. And the collection is for the churches, is for the ministry, is for the work of God. Verse number three, he said, and when I come... So Paul is planning to come by this church. Whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. So they were given, and some of that money was going back to Jerusalem, to the church that was there to help their needs. And you study out the church early on in the book of Acts and how it started very strong in Jerusalem, just like the... Uh, the prophecy was in Acts 1 and 8, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And you see the church started out in Jerusalem, but the church in Jerusalem kind of busted up through persecution. And then, they, but then they moved down to Antioch, and they were first called Christians there, so you see the progressiveness of the church. But the church back in Jerusalem was having some financial issues, and so Paul said they were taken up with the collection. And Paul said, when I come that I would take the offerings back to the church and whoever you approved in the church of Corinth could go back with me to take the money. It's always a wise process in a church to keep more than one eyes on money, to keep people from accusing one another and just to keep order and structure. And so you see this principle here. He said we will bring it back. Verse 4, he said, And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. And you can go, send it, but if you want me to go with them, I'll go with them. He said, now, I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. Now he starts to describe his journeys to where he is headed. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. And so Paul said, I'm journeying through Macedonia. I will possibly come by you 
that's Corinth. Spend some time there in Corinth till winter. Of course, traveling would be a lot easier after the winter. Amen. Especially when they don't have the four-wheel drives like you have today. Amen. They're running on camel and, and horseback and, and foot and boats. And so it would be nice to winter there. He said in verse 7, And I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. But he says this in verse 8 and 9, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. And that's where the verse you can really pinpoint this thing in the book of Acts where it's at. He says this is the reason. For a great door... And effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. I said, I'm going to come, maybe to winter there with you for a while, journeying through. He said, but I would stay a little longer, but I'm going to tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. And then he gives the reason in verse 9, for a great door and effectual is open to me. And there are many adversaries. Let's ask the Lord to help us as we look in this thought this morning on an open door at Ephesus. An open door at Ephesus. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Brother Jeff Thomas, would you pray for us, brother? Thank you, Lord. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes, help them, Lord. Help them. Help us. Amen. All of God's people said? Verse 9, verse 8 and 9, he said, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost for a great door and effectual is open to me, and there are many adversaries. You know, it's very clear as you read the Bible and you begin to study open doors, and we're talking about the open door here at Ephesus, that God opens doors in our lives, and God opens doors in our lives so we would step through them. You don't have to knock the door down. God swings it open, and it is our responsibility as God opens that door in whatever capacity, in whatever situation it might be, that we as God's people step through it. Paul said there was a door here, and I will tell you an emphasis because it is a great door and effectual opening to me. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the next book that he wrote to this Corinthian church in verse 12, he says, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. You know what Paul realized? Hey, there's a great door, he said, is open unto me, and in the context of Paul's writings, he realizes that it's the God of heaven that is opening these doors. Yeah, right. It's not his will, something he's trying to make happen. It is God working in his life, opening doors in his life to do a work for him. If you was to read for, uh, Revelation chapter 3 in verse 7 and 8, the Philippian church, turn over there, hold your place here in Corinthians, and we'll preach out of this passage here. Look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Now, in Revelation chapter number 3, Paul, or John, excuse me, is describing the seven churches here. And these are literal churches, but they also represent history. And it's obvious to see that the Philadelphia church, Revelation 3 verse 7 is where we'll read to start with, it's not the age that we're living in, the next church age, which is the Laodicean church age, and verse 14 is the church age we're living in. Right. The Philadelphian church is known as the, door, or the church of the open door. There were doors open. The Philadelphia church age was somewhere between 1500 to 1900. If you study church history and you can study these seven churches and they represent this time in history and God has it laid out before it ever happened because God, the author, knew what was going to happen. Right. And so the Philadelphian church is that church age. Matter of fact, 1500s to 1900s, wrap your mind around it, this King James Bible from 1611 was given during that open door period. 
And there's never been an open door like there was in that age. And the open door is... Uh, it's part in part to the word of God itself that God has given to spread the truth around the world. And God gave great opportunity and a great door was opened during that time. Now, we're not in that time right now. We're in the lay of the sea in church age at the moment. But there was a time when the doors were wide open all over the world. I mean, it didn't matter where you go, where it's going around the globe. God had doors wide open to take the gospel in that people might be saved, that, that churches would be established, work would be done. And there's never been a work done in the world of history like there was during the Philadelphian church age. Look what he said in verse number 7 in, uh, in Revelation 3. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that had the key of David, listen to this, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. He said during that time of the Philadelphian church age, there was an open door so wide open that nobody could shut it. It didn't matter how much persecution it came. It didn't matter how much the devil threw at it. God had swung the door wide open. His King James Bible was running rapid. It was being spread all over the world. It was stirring up the hearts of saints. It was saving sinners. The work of God was moving like you had never seen it before. Amen. Hey, what an exciting time during the Philadelphian church age where doors were open everywhere. Not only were they open, there was multitudes of people, if you read church history, that stepped through those doors. People were willing, amen. They were not only a harvest that was ready to be harvested, there was labors in the harvest. It's not like you're trying to pry people today to, hey, walk through a door, step through the door. God's opening doors. He's still opening doors, but it was not on the capacity that it was at that time. It was a great wide open door. Now, even though it's not the Philadelphian church age, God is still opening doors. Hey, God is not. Now, it's not something so wide open as it was in the Philadelphian church age. Matter of fact, let's look at the Laodicean church a little bit further down. Look in uh, uh, verse number 3, 20, verse number 20. Here's what he said to the church age that we're living in. This is history being fulfilled here and shown here in the Bible. The church age we're living in is the Laodicean church age, which is described from verse 14 down through verse 22. If you wanted to go back and maybe read some of that today and see the history, how it played out, and then you could study church history literally and you could see how it worked. But the Laodicean church age started in the early 1900s. It's a matter of fact, the Laodicean church age where they're increased with goods and have need of nothing. God said, you're neither cold nor hot. He said, I would you were cold or hot because you're lukewarm. I spew you out of my mouth. The church age that we're living in today kind of just makes God sick. Yeah. I mean, that's what he describes there in the Laodicean church age. And one of the reasons is, is around that early time, if you studied the history of the church age, hey, where the King James Bible was predominant in the 1500s to the 1900s, it's the early 1900s when they started revising the Bible. So they're making new, new Bibles to make it more friendly for people, more understandable for people. And that's what they're saying was. And really it was corrupting the Word of God. And when you start attacking the Word of God and diluting down the Word of God, hey, God starts shutting some doors. It's a, hey, people are not willing to step through the doors that are open because it's a lukewarm church age that we're living in. And here's what he describes about that thought of this open door. Look at verse number 20. Here's what he said to the church that we're living in today. Behold, I stand at the door. The Philadelphian church is the, door, the church of the open door. It's wide open, spread abroad, and no man shut it. It's all over and spread it everywhere. But where we're living at today, God said, I'm standing at the door. And knock, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Isn't it amazing that the Philadelphian church, as he describes it as the church of the open door, open and no man shut it, it's wide open, but then when you get to the Philadelphian church, age, hey, God doesn't say he's open the door. God said he's standing at the door. Right. God is a gentleman that's saying, hey, you shut me out, right. 
You shut, look at history, amen. They shut him out of the courthouses, take down the Ten Commandments, shut him out of the school, take prayer out, take Bible reading out of the schools. You begin to shut the doors that God had wide open everywhere. It didn't matter where you went, amen, to the courthouse, the schoolhouse, the jailhouse. The word of God was open. It was spread. Everybody wanted it. Now it's a kick against it. We've shut the door, and God's standing there, and he's knocking, wanting to come in the door. And the thing is, he says, if you open it. If you open it, amen. God is still opening doors today, but in the next couple of weeks, by the help of the Lord, I'd like to look at some doors that we need to open or we need to reopen. Well, he says to the Philadelphian church, it's an open door, but the church today is a shut door and God wants to come in. So there's some things we need to open back up. So I'm going to look at that as the weeks of progress. We'll see how far it goes. But I want to draw your attention back to the verse back in 1 Corinthians 16 and kind of whet your taste for the thought about the effectual open door in the, in the church of Ephesus. Amen. Now let's look at this open door at Ephesus that God had given to Brother Paul where he said, A great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Let's look at this verse 9 this morning. Number one, we see the great door. That's what he said in verse 9. For a great door. It's a great door. Amen. Hey, ever since Paul came to the door of salvation, remember what he said in first, uh, John chapter 10 and verse number 9? Jesus said, I am the door. Yeah, amen. amen. He said, I am the door by me if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Hey, you know Jesus is the door of salvation. Hey, these great effectual doors that God wants us to walk through as believers, it starts at the day that we walk through the door of salvation. He said, I am the door of salvation. Any man shall, uh, shall, shall come to me, shall enter in, he shall be saved, listen to this, and shall go in and out and find pasture. Hey, the apostle Paul walked through the door of salvation and he's found pasture in and out after salvation to serve the Lord. And God has opened up many other doors because he walked through the door of salvation. I can stop right here and say this before we go any further. If you're here in your walls, I'm going to talk to God's people this morning about the doors that are opening in your life as a Christian and we'll look at this in the next several weeks. Hey, but you need to walk through the door of salvation first. Hey, there's no walking through doors to serve God till you become God's child and Jesus said I am the door right. hey if you want to be saved you got to enter into the door of Jesus Christ amen. there's no other way to be saved amen. except through him amen. amen he is the door of salvation if you'll enter in you shall be saved and when you be not only be saved but you can go in and out and find this pastor amen. ever since Paul came into the door of salvation to be saved Amen. He's been looking for great doors to serve God. I mean, we studied the Apostle Paul's life, and we'll look at him here in this, uh, this setting in Ephesus where he describes this great door that's opening to him. Hey, Paul has been looking for doors. Hey, hey, Paul didn't just get saved and say, well, I'm saved and going to heaven, that's enough. I mean, Paul walked through the door of salvation, and he found the pastor the graves in. Amen. That door that got him into the heaven also got him into heaven on earth. He walked through the door of salvation and began to see life completely different. On that side of the door, there's a pastor that we can graze in and serve the Lord. Amen. Go in and out and find your pastor. Amen. Hey, Paul's been looking for great doors to serve the Lord. Hey, we as God's children that have been saved and have walked through the door of salvation should be looking for doors, great doors, to serve the Lord. Amen. It was a great door to the Apostle Paul. You know what I see first of all about this great door? I see Paul's availability. Do you know what's wrong with a lot of God's people? They're not available. Right. You know, you're never going to go through the great door and see it as a great door until you first make yourself available. Look what Paul said in verse number 3. He said, when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters... Then will I send to bring your liberality into Jerusalem. Remember what we said? He's going to take back this funds back to Jerusalem. He said, and if by me that I go also, they shall go with me. Now I will come unto you, 
And when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia, and it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you. Do you know what Paul said in his Christian life? He began to see the great effectual doors. And he was available for God wherever, whenever, and to whosoever. Yeah. And you study the life of the Apostle Paul, he realized that he walked through the door of salvation. God had opened his life up to real living, and he began to look for these great doors to serve God. Hey, isn't it a whole lot different when you start taking on the mentality that I'm God's child, and I'm in God's pasture down here on earth, which I know this is the devil's domain, and he's trying to attack us down here. Hey, but God has put us here to serve him, and God's given great doors for us to walk through. You know, what the wrong, you know what the problem was the average Christian is? We're not available. Paul was available. He said, I'm going to pass down through Macedonia. Hey, I'll go back to Jerusalem with your funds. If you'd like me to go with you, you can go by yourself. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter wherever. It doesn't matter whosoever. It doesn't matter whenever. I am available for God's word because I want to walk through the great doors God's given me. Oh, how exciting it is to serve the Lord when you start seeing the great doors God's put before you. Are you available? Whatever, whenever, to whosoever, Paul was available. Not only do I see Paul's availability, I see Paul's admission. Look in verse number 7, the end of that verse. We'll read the whole verse. He said, for I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. Paul was not only available, Paul made an admission. What was his admission? If the Lord permit. Do you know what Paul wanted? He had committed his life to the will of God. He said, I'm coming down there. I'll pass through, by the way, if, I, if the Lord permit. Hey, I'm, I'm available for the Lord. It doesn't matter wherever. It doesn't matter whosoever. It doesn't matter whenever. Hey, but I'm committed my life to the sails of God. I've hoisted up my sail, and the Holy Ghost can blow my ship whatever direction he wants to go. If the Lord permits, that's what I want. I don't want my will to be done. I want his will to be done. Hey, because it's a great door God's given me. I'm available, and I'm committed to God's will. Hey, ain't it a lot different in your life when you commit to whatever he wants? I mean, is that not what the Lord Jesus Christ said? Not my will, but thy will be done? If it was good enough for God, I believe it would be good enough for you and I. Is it not John the Baptist, the great man of God that he was, that he said he must increase and I must decrease? Hey, it ain't about me. It ain't about what I want. It's about the great door God's put in my life and how great a life it is in the Christian life when we get our minds wrapped around what God has given us to do, the great doors he's opened to you and I. It's not Philadelphia. It's, it's Laodicea, but there's still great doors to walk through in our lives. I see his availability. I see his admission, but I see his action. Look what he said in verse 8. But I will tarry at Ephesus under Pentecost. Now, I'm trusting God's will, and if God gives me an opportunity to stay by there for you and tarry a little while, win or in, I'll trust God for whatever he wants. He said, but as at the moment... I will tarry at Ephesus in the Pentecost for a great door and effectual is opening to me. Hey, you know what Paul did? Paul was not only available, he made the admission that he wanted God's will, but I see Paul's actions. You know what he did? He took advantage of the opportunity. This is where I'm at. God has put me at Ephesus. I see the door slam wide open. It is a great door here. There's a great harvest field. There's a great work to be done in this area. And if you study it out in the book of Acts, Paul spent three years at Ephesus on this third missionary journey because there was a, such a great door and a great opportunity to serve the Lord in his travelings around the world. Hey, God had permitted him to pass through Ephesus and God began to work through his life. He began to help him establish churches. Hey, rebuked the evilness of that day. It was a great door that God had given him, and he took action and took the opportunity God had given him and went forward. Yeah, right. Do you know how many opportunities God's given us in our lives? Opportunities, great doors that are out there, but you know what the problem is? God swung them wide open, and we shut them, like the Laodicea in church age, and God's sitting out there saying, hey, if you just knock, I'll open it back up. I want to sup with you. 
I want to fellowship with you. I want to use you. Paul said there was a great door. Amen. He was available. He made the, 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 the definite admission, God's will, not his, and he took action. He took advantage of his opportunity. Hey, you know what? If you're not careful, you're going to lose the opportunity God's giving you. Right now, you get caught up in yourself and you blow the opportunity. You ever look back on life and thought, man, I wish I'd have done it different. There was such an opportunity there. There was such a great door at that moment in my life. God has swung it wide open like two doors, not one. He swung them open both, wide slam open, and all I had to do was step through it. God had given me the way. God had paved the way. God had put everything in order, but because of fear, lack of faith, a lack of submitting, lack of taking a step, I, I blew it. Paul took advantage of it. I see there was a great door. Number two, I see it was a great opening. He said, for a great door, verse 9, and effectual is opening to me. Not only was there a great door, there was a great opening. An effectual opening was to him. This is what I said is Paul's third missionary journey. You can find this in Acts 18, verses 19 through verses tw chapter 20 through verse 16. Amen. There's a whole chapter 19, some of the end of chapter 18 and some of the beginning of chapter 20. And then he re rehearses that thing. You can see it in the end of chapter 20 when he calls the Epheson elders there and he starts telling them all he had done. He had not shunned to declare in them all the counsel of God. It was a great opening to Paul. Amen. Hey, you know what this opening was? Hey, here's some of the things that took place during that time. You can go back and read it and check it out. Amen. He was straightening out some doctrine in that time. It was a great door there. There were people teaching false heresy. They didn't understand salvation the way it is through grace, through faith, through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were some trying to go back into the law of Moses, come back into the baptism of John. And Paul said, man, it's a door wide slam open. God's given me the gospel to straighten now this world as people dying and going to hell don't realize how to be saved it's wide open the doctrine needs to be straightened out hey God will put ways in your life and open up doors to spread truth in this world amen. it was a great opening amen he was straightening out doctrine he was teaching them about the kingdom of God you'll find all these things recorded in that section over there in this third missionary journey hey he was stirring the people up so much it was such a great door Hey, those three years that he spent in Ephesus and the great work that he done for God, hey, God permitted it, God allowed it, God put him there, and Paul realized, I'm going to tarry here, I'm going to take advantage of this great door, this great opening, and do something great for my God. Hey, he turned that city upside down because he stepped through the door. He was straightening out their doctrine. He was teaching them about the kingdom of God, how salvation comes within them, and God wants to use their life. He stirred them up over there. You can go back and read it. Well, he stirred those people so much up that they were taking their false literature, those corrupt books that they were reading with sorcery and other things, uh, corrupt manuscripts, and they had a book burning. I mean, he, 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 I mean, this place, he, it was a great door to, to not only uh, sh uh, show, straighten out some doctrine, hey, show people their need to be saved, establish people in their lives, hey, challenging Christians to get out from the world, get away from the worldliness, burn your bad literature, get rid of your junk. Hey, they had a great big burning of their literature and said, this ain't good for us. Hey, these are some of the things he did in that great door. Hey, you could look back in your life. If you would walk through that great opening, and maybe you can look back in history like Paul did and start going to the Ephesian elders and saying, hey, God done something here. I, I cease not to warn you day and night with tears. I, I, I served the Lord. I preached it. Hey, no matter how much was against me, I trusted God. I served God. Hey, we saw people saved. We saw people's lives changed. We saw Christians mature, burning their literature, amen. Hey, going forward for the cause of Christ. It was a great work of God in that place, a great opening. Hey, you never know how much one life that a step through a great door with a great opening could do great things for God. Never know what your life could do on that job. What your life could do at that school. What your life could do in your neighborhood. What your life could do around your family. Hey, because you were willing to walk through the door God opens. How many times have we kept our mouth shut when we should have stepped through it and spoke? Hey, how many times have we spoke when we should have kept our mouth shut? It was a great door. 
Paul walked through that door. He rebuked their false worship of Diana hey, over there. There was a great work that was done. Hey, why? Because it was a great opening and Paul had a desire to help saints. Where's your desire? I mean, where, I mean when, it, when it boils down to your life, Paul said, hey, a great door and effectual is open to me and there are many adversaries. He said, but I'm going to tarry here. I'm not going anywhere. This opening is so big. I have such a desire to help the saints. There were some saints that didn't want help. There were some that kicked against his work. No doubt he had some hardships in his life. But Paul saw the great opening and took advantage of the opportunity because his desire was to help the saints. His desire was to see souls saved. His desire was to snatch another one out of hell. Hey, put another one's name up in heaven. Hey, then another one uh, 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 saved by the grace of God. Another one growing in grace. Hey, hey, that should be our desire. God's opening doors all around us. Hey, hey, you've never seen it like it is in our day. Now, it's not Philadelphia where the door's wide open, but you've never seen the multitude of lost people like we're living in. I mean, you throw a rock anywhere and hit a pack of sinners. It ain't hard to find them. It might be hard for them to admit that they're that, but buddy, we're living in a dark day. Hey, and there are some great doors opening to us. And, it, and, and the question is, do we have a desire to do anything? Do we have a desire to see anyone saved? Do we have a desire to see Christians grow? Do we have a desire to go forward with the Lord? Paul's prayer was this and when he wrote to the people in Colossians. He said in Colossians 4 and 3, listen to this, with all praying also for us. Paul said, pray for us. You ever ask people to pray for you? Hey, rightfully so, we ought to. Share our burdens with one another. Ask people to help our lives. But here's what Paul said. Paul said, pray with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance. Paul said, my prayer is that you pray that God open up a door of utterance. Why? He said this, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I, which I am also in bonds. Paul said, I'm, I want you to pray. Pray that God would open doors in my life. Pray that I'd walk through the great doors and the great openings and God would open up more and more would be done. There was a great door. There was a great opening. But I see lastly there was great faith. Great faith. If you're going to walk through the great doors and the great openings, there's got to be some great faith. I mean, look at this again. Look in verse 8. But if I tarry, but, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Why? For a great door. And an effectual opening to me. What's that next word? And. That's just a little word, ain't it? But look what he said. Look at it again. For a great door, so there's the great door, an effectual opening is the great opening, and there are many adversaries. You see how you get great faith out of many adversaries? Because of what he said. Did you catch what he said? I don't believe he caught it yet. He said a great door and effectual is opening to me. And he said, what? And. And there are many adversaries. Do you get it yet? He said, a great door is open to me. And a, a great door is open and effectual is opening to me. And there are many adversaries. You know what he didn't say? A great door and effectual is open to me, but there are many adversaries. You get it? He didn't say, but. He could have said, hey, a great door is opening. A great door, an effectual opening, but there are many adversaries. You know what that would mean? Hey, it's open, it's great, the door is great, the opening is great, but there's too much kicking. You see the faith of the Apostle Paul? He said, I will tell you at Ephesus until Pentecost. Why? Because there's a great door, an effectual opening to me, and there are many adversaries. I realize there's something fighting, but I ain't stopping it. I realize they're there, but I'm still going forward, amen. Hey, you know what our problem is? There's a great door, preacher. I see the effectual opening. There's things I can do for God, and by the grace of God, as we look through some of the doors we can walk through in the next couple of weeks, hey, they might be something that slips up in your mind or maybe crawls up on your shoulder and says, yeah, but there's a great opening. There's a great door. There's an effectual opening, but you're not qualified. 
There, there's a great, open, great door, uh, uh, an effectual opening to me, but you can't do it. You're not able. You're not fit. You, you're not eloquent enough. You can't speak enough. Hey, hey, you know how many people have backed up on a calling of God, maybe to be a preacher, maybe to be a missionary because of, but there's many adversaries. Yeah. Yeah, the door's been opened. God swung it open. God's put the calling on your life. Hey, God's put the burden in your soul. But I can't do it. The apostle Paul said there's a great door and effects you open to me and there are many adversaries. I'm not going into it blind. I realize there's going to be people that's going to fight. I realize they're going to, they're going to attack. I know the devilishness that's going down in Ephesus. I know the worship of Dana. I know the worship of those wicked books. I know there's many people that hate God and hate the truth that God's given me. And there's many adversaries, but I know my God has opened the door. And I'm going to tarry in Ephesus. I ain't running. I'm staying because I got faith in what God can do in my life and this great door that's open. It was great faith. You know what we need to walk through the doors that God's put in our life or maybe to reopen some doors that we have shut? We need faith. I mean great faith. Faith that'll, that'll move mountains. Faith that'll remove doubt. Faith that'll remove fear. Faith that'll cause us to step forward and say, I'm not ashamed to name the name of Christ. I'm not ashamed to tell you about my Savior. I'm not ashamed to tell you there's a, a life that's worth living and it ain't in this whole world that's living holy and righteous and serving God. Paul said, and there are many adversaries. I know that, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but I ain't backing down. There's a great door. There's a great opening, but there was great faith. He said, and there are many adversaries. He didn't say but. He said, and. Paul knew if you're going to do something for God, the world, the flesh, and the devil will fight it. But he was going to go through it by God's grace and serving. There's a great door. And effects will open to me. And there are many adversaries. Hey, you know what you got out there? Adversaries. There's many. Some we make up. Some we conjure up in our own mind. Some, they're real and people are attacking us with it. But it's all about the eye of faith that you look at it. Hey, yeah, these adversaries. But guess what? My God's opened the door. Yeah, right. It's a great door. It's a great opportunity. Amen. It's a great opening. And I'm going to exercise great faith. In closing, you know, you could look over to the Revelation chapter number 4 after he describes those churches. In Revelation chapter 4, verse number 1, the Bible said that John saw. He looked up. Remember what he saw? He saw a door open in heaven. Hey, that's a great door. You know what that is, Revelation 4? That's the rapture. That's us leaving and going home to be with God. That is a great door, a great opening. Amen. Hey, hey, the great faith to see it. Amen. Hey, he said there was a door open in heaven. He saw the door that was open. Amen. Amen. And the door opened and God said, come up hither. Do you know we're heading to that door? Yeah, amen. That's, that's going to be the last door we walk through. Yeah. But listen, as we're headed to that door, and I hope it happens in my life, it could very well happen in our lives. It could, we could die and pass on and it happen later on. But I'm looking for that door to open and God say, come up hither. Yes. But here's the thought. Until I walk through that great door, by God's grace, I want to walk through some more great ones that lead to that one. Yes. Right. That's the final door to walk through. Listen, don't let the only door you ever walk through be the one where you got saved, Jesus is the door, and the one that takes you home. We walk through that door of salvation and we are to go in and out and find pastor. In and out. That's going through other doors, moving around, until God said he opens that door in heaven. Have you walked through any doors? You say, what doors? I know. Let the Spirit of God speak to you. Some doors God's opening in your life, and they're great. Maybe you fear Maybe you doubt. Maybe you think you can't. Listen, God would have never opened it if you couldn't go. Never. God is always making it available. He just wants somebody.
to walk through. If it's open, it's God. Walk through it. Trust Him. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe you're here and you're lost and you need to walk through the door of salvation today. What a great day to be saved. Maybe you are saved. I hope you are trusting to all that are saved today. Hey, are you walking through the doors? Maybe, maybe we need to get back like the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, uh, to the people in Colossians. Hey, pray for us that God will open the door of utterance. Why don't you maybe come today and say, God, open some doors in my life. I want to enjoy the, the bliss of salvation. I've walked through the door of salvation, and I've got no doubt that I'm going to go through the door in the rapture one day and go home, whether it be by death or, the, or, or alive. But I want to walk through some doors on my way. I want to get the faith of the Apostle Paul for a great door and effectual is open unto me. Give me some doors. Give me a door. I've seen you do it to somebody else. Give me a door. Give me the strength and faith to walk through it. Help me face the adversaries. Help me look at it through the eye of faith. And there's many adversaries instead of but. God, give us an and faith instead of a but. God wants to use you. God wants to give you some Ephesus doors. to be used by him. Great doors and great openings need great faith. Ask him to increase your faith. He'll do it. Ask him to help remove the doubt and trust him. For a great door. Can you say that? A great door and effectual is open unto me. And there are many adversaries. Amen. Everybody stand. Let's sing a song. Sing a verse or something. Let's sing a verse before we leave. We got food out there, right? Stay and eat with us. Fellowship. It's a little cold, but it's warm in the fellowship, all I'm sure, and some warm food. You need to pray for one another. Pray for service tonight at 6, 5.30 in our prayer rooms. 3.85 in the red song book. Softly and tenderly, amen. 3.85, let's find it, amen. Let's sing that first verse. 3.85, amen. Softly and tenderly, Jesus. Like that, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you. It's an amazing thought to think that God could use me. Isn't it amazing? You ever think about it? Hey, the God of heaven is interested in my life. Amen. And his opening doors, he just wants me to walk through them. Amen. Amen.
continue to pray for one another, pray for the sick, that God will continue to heal them up and get them better. Some have been through it and on the other side, thank God for that, but some are still in it and some are entering in it. It's just that season of sickness, amen, but God's good, amen. Pray for God's grace on their lives, amen. You could feel the pain they're going through if you just came out of it, can't you, amen? So keep them in your prayers. Uh, remember Miss Jennifer, she started her treatments, amen. I pray God to do something special there, amen. Remember Daddy over there in the hospital with that probably congestive heart failure that God's will to be done there, amen. All hearts clear. 5.30 prayer room, 6 o'clock service. Uh, we got, hey, did you bring those bookmarks? We'll bring them tonight. We've got them. we got bookmarks made for the whole schedule for the year of all our events coming up uh, that we have planned out already so you can have it and use it as a marker as you read your Bible through. Be in your Bible. Get in your Bible. You need the Bible. Amen. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. But that's a good bookmark, and it shows the events coming up. Luke has one here. We'll try to bring them tonight and get you all one. They look real good. Amen. Turned out nice. We try to here. I can show it to you, but you can't read it. Too far away. It's about this size. It's got all the events. It's the church logo at the top. It's nice. Amen. So we'll get you one tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's dismiss in prayer. Brother Terry Brooks, how about dismissing, buddy?